that that we have to uh, analyze the patient so carefully and find out which one will benefit they only can most of the patients around 75% will do very well with medication they don't need anything else they don't have any scarring in the brain they don't have any tumor in the brain nothing what is, what is the incidence of epilepsy in india um i bet it's difficult because it's it's, it's it's probably underreported right underreported that is true yes underreported yeah. <laughs> so do you have, what do you think are the biggest barriers now is it is it still cultural barriers that still Think individuals it's the state still themselves. cultural barriers are there still even today barriers. after 22 years i find that if a young girl is an epileptic the mother and father are worried about her marriage only yes. they are not bothered about giving the medication to her mm. right so we had a very funny uh, scenario in my opds not here yeah. in madurai it's a very uh, tough place to live in madurai there the whole village will come into the opd the boys people and the girls people she would have, they would have been married about a month ago mm -hmm. the girl would have had a fit yes okay and the fa girls people they try to pose it as this is the first one which occurred oh this is the very first time she had a fit oh my <laughs> never right. the boys people telling me no she must have had it earlier and these people right. are hiding it right so they want to talk over it and then finally get a divorce at that place in my opd <laughs> that's the hard thing it's not something you can hide like other disease processes you know i mean it's so visual if someone has a seizure it's not you know like hiding high blood pressure or hiding you know a cardiac problem yeah right and just with that stigma of it being demonized I, I just never thought of that before. You know, it's the people have a uh, very funny ideas. Yeah, uh, we are trying to break the barriers slowly. Yeah. We are trying to tell them no, she has to be on medication. There are some people who come to me uh, before their marriage. I tell them, see, you are on a particular medication, which is not, uh, I mean, compatible with having a baby. I was going to ask that. See, okay. so I'll have to change you to a different medicine. Please tell me if you're getting married. Please tell me beforehand. Yes. So they do. Some oh, of them okay. are very intelligent enough to come, get it changed, so that next childbearing period they'll be in a safe anti-epileptic right. medication. Right. Okay. What about the onset of epilepsy? What is the typical onset? Is it? Is it childhood onset or is it any any time. so there is no <coughs> any time so it can be at any it can point. be from the first neonate yes to the day you're lying at 100 years old oh my gosh any time you can get it mm. anybody can get it wow it's a very simple uh, logic that is your brain keeps on giving a lot of messages okay. your neurons keep on giving it bombarding your body with that but there is a block at some stage which says that this is what you should do this you shouldn't do oh, okay. that block is momentarily removed it's called a gate okay. momentarily it's removed and then you have uh, excessive movement which results in loss of consciousness and then, and then the other problem it's only self limiting disease normally it lasts for 1 minute to 2 minute sometimes for I minutes mean, very rarely for minutes right after that they are unconscious for about 30 minutes they recover yes. they recover very well this is the sequence and that's so sad that it is demonized when it's something that is like you said self limiting and yeah i have one question just to go back to how we started talking about women in neurosurgery you speak with such grace and compassion about your patients And you started off by talking about a very male-dominated profession that you're in. To what extent do you think it was you, as a woman in neurosurgery, that allowed this outreach to evolve? Yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. You know, because yeah. you know, women are mothers. Yeah. They understand compassion and grace, yes. and they have many skills and gifts that men don't have, and uh, particularly men of power. 
And so I'm listening to how you're talking about these young women, like they're your own children. Yeah. And, uh, and I keep looking over at this sign, realizing that that's a huge gift that you're offering back. Yes, please. This is how, it, I mean, I was taught by Dr. T.S. Kanaka how to write that notebook. Yeah. Uh, she taught me. She said, please ask them to write this. Yeah. I'm yeah. still continuing. Now I find that sometimes from Chennai, some patient comes with a notebook. Huh? With her handwriting there. Really? Yeah. So, uh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. You know, something which others t taught you, you, continue to do. Yes. That is it. Well, the whole idea of journaling, right, is, is not a stranger to this culture, right? So, well, that's fascinating. This is the smallest contribution from me yeah. to the oh. society. <laughs> that is it. He's got a medical so background, and uh, so it's quite, yeah, okay. he does uh, pulmonary and critical care medicine. Okay. He trained in Montreal. Okay. Yeah, that's Miguel. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Same yeah. thing. So, so, I, so you know, like, like male neurosurgeons, mm -hmm. I practice in a, some specialty in medicine that is male dominated similarly and very technologically dominated, mm -hmm. much like neurosurgery is. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to forget about the human. Okay. And the needs right. and the, you know, the fears, the angst, the spirit, all those other things that really make humans and all of us as physicians need to remember. Yeah. Because in my world, in critical care, about one third of the people that survive being critically ill never go back to work, never go back to school. Okay. Because the care that they've had to undergo has created, you know, PTSD or other mental conditions that they aren't functional. And so, you know, so what I hear from you is that you're taking these young people and transitioning them through life to allow them to always be functional in a, in a, in a way that all of us want to be. And so it's lovely to hear. This kind of uh, uh, hope we give them oh, to nice live way. and live your life as you would like to do it. Right. I always tell them about uh, John T. Rhodes. Yeah. He is a known epileptic. And then the tennis player Leander Pace mm -hmm. who developed it. And all these people we just tell so them just about. Just to normalize the disease. Right? Yeah, they are absolutely yeah. normal. They're yeah. great people. They are playing cricket. Yeah. They are playing tennis. You know what? It, it, in Canada, it's about hockey, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a hockey player played for a team called the Detroit Red Wings. And uh, about 12 or 13 years ago, everybody thought that he had a heart condition when he came to the bench. Okay. And he was just having a seizure. But they left oh. it. They left it to be known in the public press that he was having a cardiac issue. Oh, okay. It was better that than, in their mind, to, to say that he was having a seizure. Wow. He was a young Russian hockey. Okay. So it's interesting. So even in our society, there's stigma against a lot of medical conditions, right? Um, yeah. Okay. That's that so interesting. Is it. Thanks for sharing that. Thank story. you. It was lovely. Thank you very much. That's Thanks great. a lot for giving us this opportunity here. Wow. <laughs> You've been helping us a lot, I know. Okay. I see all of you regularly. <laughs> I see all your faces regularly. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Whenever you come to see Amma, yeah. so I see you all uh, here. Yeah. It's a treat being here. Correct. It's a gift. So, well.